Okay, so 22b. And we're discussing a dispute between Rav and Shmuel. Good morning. Uh, there's, there's copies over there. You can see the piles there. Um, dispute between Rav and Shmuel as to whether or not you're allowed to light from one candle to another. And we had a dispute as to what the reasoning for Rav saying you're not allowed to. Is the reason that Rav saying you're not allowed to is because of disrespect to the mitzvah? In which case, if you're lighting from one candle directly to the other, it's not a problem, because they're both mitzvah and therefore there's no disrespect. If, however, the reason for Rav forbidding is because of akhushi mitzvah, you're diminishing the original candle, then it doesn't matter if you're lighting from a candle directly, it's always a problem. If the issue is disrespect, then there's no problem to write the candle directly from the other. The forebodance is only if you're lighting with the medium of something else, but which chip in the Gemara's language. Clear? Can you repeat that last part? If it's because of disrespect, if that's why Rav forbade it, then the forbiddance is limited to a case where you are lighting with the medium of something else. So you have one candle, Hanukkah candle, and you take a wick, you light it, and then you light your other candle with it. In which case, you disrespect because your original lighting is using something that isn't the mitzvah. Right? Whereas if the question is an issue of diminishment of the original candle, then even if you'd light directly one mitzvah to the other, you're still diminishing the original candle. It's still a problem. Clear? Those are the two different views in understanding Rav's forebodings. Whereas Shmuel is permissive. So our Shmuel's permissiveness will be the equivalent of Rav's forebodings. I think that's the word forebodings, right? Isn't that a word? Yeah. It's a word, right? So Rav's permissiveness is equal to, Shmuel's permissiveness is equal to that which Rav per- forbades. So if Rav forbids lighting directly one candle to the next, then Shmuel permits that, which would mean he might agree that it's forbidden to light with the medium of something else in between because his permissiveness is limited to one mitzvah directly from the other. If, however, Rav's of the view that even one candle directly to the other is forbidden, sorry, if Rav's of the view that only a lighting with the medium is forbidden, but Rav will allow one candle to the next because Rav's reason is disrespect, and if the reason is disrespect and lighting one mitzvah to the next is not a problem, then that would mean that Shmuel even forbids that. So that, that, mean, that would mean that Shmuel permits that, but for, agrees that it's forbidden to light with the medium. Clear? If Rav is of the view that, that it's the only forbidden yes, is, one, is, with, is with a medium, right. because it's issue of disrespect, then Shmuel, then Shmuel would argue and say that that too is for, for permissible, even to light with a medium. So if Rav's reason is, is disrespect, which means he forbids lighting with the medium, uh, he forbids only he forbids lighting with the medium. Then Shmuel permit lighting with the medium. And that's not lacha. At least according to some of these. Okay, so it's a little it's a little bit uh, difficult. Is everybody following? It's a, it's a bit hard to, dif- to to sorry. Okay, let's put Shmuel aside for a moment. Let's just stick with Rav himself. What's Rav forbidding? Is he forbidding the use of lighting one candle to the next? Or is he only forbidding lighting with a medium and permitting lighting one candle to the next? There's a dispute. <coughs> if Rav's reason for forb- we just all we know is that Rav said it's forbidden to light one candle to the next. We didn't specify how or why. He just says it's forbidden to light one candle to the next. If his reason is for disrespect, then lighting one candle to the do- another directly, one mitzvah to another, is not disrespectful. So his forbiddance is only limited to lighting with a medium. Light- lighting one wood chip from the actual manure and then lighting another one with it. Which would mean he allow lighting one candle to the next. If the reason for Rav is because you are diminishing the original candle, then it doesn't matter what you're using. Even if you're lighting one candle directly to another, it's still forbidden. Put Shmuel aside. 
leaving Rav there. That's going to be the main discussion. Okay? Even though the halacha is follow Shmuel, but again, Shmuel permits that which Rav forbid, forbids. So wherever you see Rav forbidding, that's where Shmuel is permitting. Correct. So if Rav is only forbidding lighting one lighting, lighting with the medium of a wood chip in between, that means Shmuel allows that too. If Rav is only forbidding, if Rav is only forbidding lighting one candle to the next, or is even forbidding one candle to the next, because of disrespect, because you're diminishing the original mitzvah, which is why even if it's two mitzvahs, it's still a problem, then that means Shmuel only permits that. Which means if you ask Shmuel in that scenario, can you use a medium? Shmuel would say no. Whereas in the other version, Shmuel would say yes. Because in the other version, that's what I was forbidding. I was forbidding only the medium. And then therefore, that, that's what Shmuel is permitting. Clear? It's a bit confusing. Shmuel is always going to be permitting that which Rav says no. Well, we, because, well, we just have a dispute from Rav and Shmuel. We don't know what, they, we don't know what the scenario is or what the reasons are. But ba- years later, they, they have discussed what's the reason for Rav's forbidding. And whatever the reason for Rav forbidding is will also tell us what the reasons for Shmuel permissiveness is. So they have to be in... in the has to be has to match to a dispute they had, correct? Clear? Okay. So now... All to say that we have the dispute coming down to may you light using a medium or not. That's what it comes down to. That it will depend on the, on the interpretation of Rav and Shmuel. May you, may you light using a candle in between or not. If it's a question of disrespect, no. Well, according, actually according to both opinions, it's a problem. According to Rav at least, using Rav's opinion. Using a medium. Oh, yes, for sure. Using a medium is forbidden in both cases according to Rav. According to one version, it might be permissible according to Shmuel. Okay, so now let's see the Gemara. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines on top of the page. Second to last word, Masiv. Masiv Rav Sheshis. Rav Sheshis raised the following objection. And this seems to contradict all versions. Or three out of the four, I should say, actually. Anyway, the Pasuk says, You shall set up the menorah right outside the curtain of testimony. The curtain of testimony is, of course, is the curtain that separates between, that separates between the Holy of Holies and the sanctuary, the Holy itself. And the, whole, the menorah is positioned in the, in the section of the temple called the Holy, right in front of the curtain which led to the Holy of Holies. That's the Pasuk says. Set it up there. And now this Mishnahic age text comments, the one that Rav Sheshis is quoting as an objection to the original question of Rav and Shmuel. So the Gemara there reads, the Mishnah, sorry, the, it's a Teres Karnim, it's a Medrash, it's a Halachic Medrash, but it's a Mishnahic age text, which reads like this, V'chilu Does God need the light? Does God need light that we're putting a menorah right outside of His Holy Holies where God's presence is? But like, For the entire 40 years that the Jewish people went in the desert, they went by his light, right? the pillar of fire that led the Jewish people. So they traveled based on God's light. Now all of a sudden, God needs the Jewish people's light. doesn't need light. So what does God need this for? Ella rather, the menorah is a testimony, bears testimony to the fact that the presence of God rests amongst the Jewish people. That's what the menorah does. The menorah bears testimony for the world that the presence of Hashem is here. How does it bear testimony if nobody sees it? People do see it. You could see it if you're standing in the sanctuary. But more importantly, it's, uh, it's still, this is all in the context of the menorah being in the presence of Hashem. Right? As if to say, uh, it's a physical manifestation of Hashem's presence in the world. Okay. So in what way, my edus, in what way did the menorah Bear testimony. It's just a lamp. It's a lantern that's burning. Where's the testimony? So Omar Rav, so I've explained, Zun Ne Maravi. This is the Western lamp. Shenoisim Bob, we'll explain this in a minute, in a moment. Shenoisim Bob Shemen Kimi Das Chavert, Chavert Esau. That all these seven candles get the same amount of oil. 
right? The way the menorah was lit, lit was lit before, during the day, at the end of the day, before nightfall. And then, depending on which, uh, which years and whether there was miraculous lighting or not, but let's just go with the fact that there was a miraculous lighting before a certain era, and the menorah would last, basically, the lamp would be burned all the way till the next evening. And then the next evening, they would clear it out and relight it. Later time, it didn't last that long, and they would clear it out in the morning. At least partially clear it out in the morning, depending on which view, as Rashi elaborates on over here. But it's essentially what happened. They lighted it before it was nightfall, and it would, let's just say, during the time of the miracle, light it before it fell, before, at the end of the day, before it was dark, and then it would last until the next day, when they had to relight it again, 24 hours later. I think just before nightfall. Sorry? Sometime around then, before nightfall. Okay, so now the, the, there is one of the one of these seven lamps was called the western lamp. There's two views which way the menorah stood. If the menorah, the menorah stood north-south or east-west. So if it stood east-west, then the western lamp is actually the middle one. If it stood, no, I'm sorry. If it stores, if it's there north south, if it's the north south, right? That means, sorry, right? So the west is in the back, and the east is in the front of the menorah. So all seven candles are equally east to west, right? Because they're facing north south. So the western one is the middle one, and it was the middle one in this view because the three candles on the side, their wicks would be facing the center, and then the center one, the middle one, the western one, would be, the, the wick would be facing west towards the holy of holies. That's the western candle in that view. In the other view, that the menorah itself stood east to west. So you would imagine the western one's the last one closest to the west, but it's not. It's actually the second one from the east. And the reason is because the Torah says to use the western one. Now, in order to qualify as west, you only have to be one after the eastern one. As soon as you're one after the most eastern one, you're already considered in the west, right? Because you traveled west. And because you want to do it the first upper because you want to do it at the first possible opportunity, so you have to go to the first western one, that would be the second one from the east. Right? So it's either the second one from the east, which Rashi substantiates as the more correct view in this Rashi here, or it's the middle one. Either way, the western lamp got the same amount of oil as all the rest of the lamps. Okay? Now, what happened? And yet, so you would imagine if they all got the same amount of oil, and they're all lit at the same time, then you would imagine they'd all burn out at the same time. And yet, it was the last one to be lit. No, I'm sorry. It was the first one to be lit and the last one to be cleaned out. So that means they would light the other candles using the Western one, which is miraculous, which means it lasted longer than the rest of them. Every, Every single night. So all of them would last 24 hours and this would last 24 hours and enough time to relight the other candles. Thus making a miraculous candle. Because it was a miraculous candle, this was the testimony to the world that the presence of Hashem is here because a daily miracle occurred where this one western lamp lasted longer than the other six. But why is the Gemara quoting it here? What's happening here? They're lighting the other six candles from this one candle. Sorry? First, so then the Gemara asks, Because each of the six candles were actually fixed in their place so it's impossible the only way to light the other six candles from the western one is to use a wood chip in between but they're using the old light they're using the old light it's light. still a mitzvah light the same way the menorah is a mitzvah light but I'm saying they're, they're removing the old light from the day before using that to, write, to light the new light they didn't remove the, the, the western one yet they didn't, they didn't remove the western one. The western one's sitting right where it is. They would light the other six, and then they would switch the western one. So they were lighting the other six ones from the original candle from the original one. Now, because they're all sitting in their place, you must therefore use some sort of medium. If that's the case, whether it's a question of disrespect, certainly disrespectful, even if you're of the view, that the only reason why it's forbidden, in a novice view, is because it's a question of diminishing the original mitzvah, then this too is diminishing the original mitzvah because you're lighting from one candle to the next. Clear? So how did we go from lighting the other six candles, from the western candle, without violating the prohibition of disrespecting the mitzvah, which we just described now, is a problem, uh, it's, it's a problem according to all views, if you're using a medium. 
at least according to, except for one version of Shmuel where it is permissible, but sticking with Rav here, it's certainly a question. Clear? Answer the Gemara, Tegim Rav Papa, Rav Papa explained, the Psilis Aruchos, they used to use long wicks. So Rashi explains like this. They would use each uh, candelabra, which is quite large, because it's able to fill like a half a log, I think. It was a huge, big amount of oil. Yeah, it's, it's the size of half a log. Uh, yeah, a log, a, a log, L-O-G, is a, is a measurement in the Torah. Lamed uh, Vav Gimel. And how much is a log? I don't even know. It's a big, it's a, it's a sizable amount of oil. And so it's a big cup to hold this oil. So they have a wick that was long enough to go to the next cup. Each wick had a long, as a, had a wick, each cup had a, long, had a wick, each lantern, each cup had a wick long enough to go to the other one. That's correct. And they would each light from the other. Right? So now, according to the view that it's a question, at least according to the view which says that it's an issue of disrespect, it's no longer disrespectful. Right? It's only a question now on the opinion which says that you're diminishing the mitzvah. Because if, if the question is diminishing the mitzvah, it doesn't matter, if, even if you're letting one mitzvah directly from the other, it's a problem. If it's a question of disrespect, there's no more disrespect because it's one mitzvah to another. Which is the Gemara about to ask. So he said at the end of the day, Laman da Amar, according to the view which says, Mishumak, Chisha Mitzvah, according to the view which says the reason why Rav forbids it is because you're diminishing the original candle, here too you're diminishing the original candle. Even if you're letting one mitzvah from the next. So there's no longer disrespect. So that view is substantiated. But the view which says it's a question of, of diminishing the mitzvah, you're diminishing the mitzvah by lighting one candle from the next. Says the Gemara, Kasha, indeed, indeed a legit question. So the Gemara takes it that this idea that the lamps of the menorah are lit from each other substantiates the view that it must be that the only problem with lighting one candle from another is a question of disrespect. Proof by the fact that one mitzvah from the other in the menorah in the temple was lit. And therefore the same would follow for our menorahs that you could light one mitzvah candle directly from another mitzvah candle. That's what it would follow from this conclusion here in the Gemara. Nonetheless, recommended practice, use your shamish. Okay, how much time is it now? Okay, a few more minutes. I don't know if that watch is correct, but... Yeah? Two more lines? So Gemara asks, My Havelah, what's the end? Give us the halacha, so what's the story? Can you light one thing from the other? Can you not light one from the other? Is the reason because it's disrespectful? Is the reason because it's diminishing the mitzvah? Says the Gemara, Amr Rav Huna B'Rit Rav Huna says, says the name of Yeshua, you don't really have to care about all the whole discussion we had earlier. The entire discussion we had earlier is not really relevant to the final conclusion. The main question you have to ask yourself is as follows. Chazina, let us evaluate. Iyad Laka Isa Mitzvah, and this is the question we began with way back at the beginning. Iyad Laka Isa Mitzvah, is the actual act of lighting the mitzvah? In which case, you may light one from the next. Because once you've lit it, the mitzvah is done and it's over. Or, um, then mitzvah, uh, yeah, mitzvah. if the act of the mitzvah is the actual mitzvah, you may light one from the next because the mitzvah was done the moment you lit it. Or, is the positioning of the menorah the mitzvah? Is the mitzvah that it should be there? Not that you should light it. So this is a big nuance here. We've already established way back at the beginning of this whole discussion that the resulting light is not the mitzvah. When it comes to the Shabbos candles, the resulting light is the mitzvah. That's the mitzvah. The mitzvah is the resulting light. You're supposed to enjoy it. When it comes to the Hanukkah candles, we, we established the resulting light is not the, not the mitzvah. Now the question becomes, so we know that the act is the mitzvah. But which act? The act of lighting it or the act of putting it down? Had Laka Isa Mitzvah, in which case, once you lit it, you're allowed to light one from the next. E, or is it, Ayanacha Isa Mitzvah, or is the placing it, putting it there, the mitzvah? And if the putting it there is the mitzvah, then, as Rashi explains it for us, then you may not light one from the next. Why? Because the lighting itself is not as big as a mitzvah as its position, and therefore it's disrespectful. Right? In other words, like this. The mitzvah is to put it down, which means like this. So let's say in theory, I light the candle holding it in my hand, and then I put it down. Did I do the mitzvah or not? 
do the, base, the basic mitzvah, not the one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. The basic mitzvah of lighting one candle every night. I'm lighting it, holding it in my hand, and then I put it down. Did I fulfill the mitzvah or not? If the mitzvah is to light it, then I didn't do the mitzvah. Because I was holding it at the time of the lighting. And I'm supposed to light it in its proper place, as we'll learn in the Gemara soon. If the mitzvah is to put it down, then I didn't do the mitzvah, I put it down. So now, if I'm going to view the mitzvah is to put it down, not the lighting. So now I have my candle lit there, and you want to light your menorah. Sorry? The Gemara seems it's one or the other. Because it's the act. Which act? Because then, yes, then if it's the mitzvah is putting it down, then you can't take it, then you can't light someone else. Oh, because if my candle is down now, I did the mitzvah. I did it holding it in my hand, and I put it down. My mitzvah is done. Now you came and took your candle and lit it. When you lit it, you didn't do a mitzvah yet. You're preparing yourself for the mitzvah. When you put it down, you did the mitzvah. Which means I'm using a mitzvah for something that's only preparing for a mitzvah. Thus, it's disrespectful. Because I'm using it for a lower level than it itself. If the mitzvah is the actual act of lighting, in the moment he put his candle touching my candle, he did the mitzvah. So his using of my menorah was for the equal mitzvah itself. Permissible. But if the, if the mitzvah is to put it down, then the moment of lighting of the mitzvah wasn't done yet, the moment the mitzvah is going to be done a few seconds later, when he puts it down. In which case, when he actually lifted my menorah, he used my menorah for a level of mitzvah which is lower than the mitzvah itself. And thus it's disrespectful. Clear? So now tomorrow we're going to go through a few different scenarios all of which is going to help us play out what's the difference whether the mitzvah is the act of lighting or whether the mitzvah is putting it down. That's going to come tomorrow, different scenarios. One of them I just mentioned to you. It was disrespectful to my menorah that he used it for, for preparing himself for his menorah. If he did his actual mitzvah with my menorah, okay, you did a mitzvah with another mitzvah. Not, not disrespectful. But if you used it to prepare yourself for your mitzvah you're going to do later, now that's disrespectful already. Right. So if the mitzvah is putting it down, then the moment of lighting is only a preparation for the mitzvah to be done later. In which case it's disrespectful. So more. So I, I gave you one scenario that makes a difference. Can I light the menorah holding it in my hand and then put it down? The Gemara is going to give other scenarios which will help us understand the difference between whether or not it's a mitzvah to light or a mitzvah to put it down, to place it. Okay, wonderful day everybody.